So yeah, we are the product development firm. So Nectar's been around for about 25 years now. We've developed hundreds of products for various clients across different industries. Um, and today we'll be talking about working with a product development firm as a medical device startup. So I'm going to give you the high-level elevator overview of Nectar, and then Stacy's going to talk more about the detail around working with a medical device startup. So the market segments. So medical and scientific has really become Nectar's focus over the last five years. About 70% of our client base is on the medical side, our scientific side currently. Um, and around that, you know, there's really specific challenges around human factors, usability, and technical challenges as well. And like everyone in this room, I mean, it's, it's really more rewarding from the team aspect about being able to help develop medical devices, which hopefully will enable um, the betterment of society eventually if, if that product gets into the market. Uh, the Internet of Things has also become a very big focus for us over the past couple of years. In the next 10 years, pretty much everything and everyone will likely be connected to the Internet. And we've seen a lot of great examples already from some of the other presenters about how medical devices will really push patient data into the cloud and how that data will be utilized by the doctor, by the patient, by the insurance company. So we don't really have to get into those examples. But we're looking at it from several aspects as well. We're looking at it from both the user experience side, from the user interface side, and also from the technical aspect on how we could actually connect the medical device with some type of IoT component, and then looking at the entire ecosystem on how everything can work together, essentially. Another market segment that Nectar has a vast experience in over the past 25 years is obviously the consumer market. That was really Nectar's focus when it originally started um, 25 years ago. Now, less of a focus, but the reason that's important is because as health and wellness becomes a big focus in this segment, which is really a combination of both medical and consumer, this becomes a big advantage in context of being able to leverage our, ex our <laughs> excuse me, our, our, our results around that, that area as well. So, for instance, you know, developing a, a medical device, or I'm sorry, developing a, a consumer water filter that we recently developed uh, about a year ago can potentially be applied to a device that might be a blood filter in kind of the, the hospital environment as well. So there's a lot of overlap between the two. And then on the industrial side, uh, a lot of past experience in this area as well. Um, and in this aspect, typically the, the issues that are being focused on are reliability, um, robustness, which there's a lot of overlap with medical device development as well. So just getting back to you know, the breadth and depth of the past 25 years developing you know, hundreds of different products across these different clients, that allows us to really kind of leverage all the past products and knowledge that we've gained over the years into any product and project that comes through the door, essentially. So these are some of the clients that Nectar has helped develop products for over the past years. You see a lot of recognizable um, medical device names there as well. And then in terms of capabilities, we break our capabilities into four key areas. So in the first area, uh, strategy and research. That's really about understanding the market, the environment, um, and also the user, you know, what their needs are, what their pain points are as they're interacting with this problem or device, and then using that as an input into the overall development program to hopefully develop ways to mitigate those pain points and then develop innovative ways to potentially differentiate the product in the market as well. And then we get more into the design development area. So we combine our user experience and our industrial design teams given the overlap between the various uh, disciplines. So under that, we have interaction design, which we focus around both the physical interaction as well as the, the digital interaction, as, especially as medical devices become smarter. There's typically a physical component that has some type of button, some type of knob that's being interacted with, some type of display that has a graphical user interface as well. 
And then we have human factors and usability. That's really about making ease of use of paramount importance, especially in you know, the medical device. Uh, we have workflows and user interface, which again, if it's a physical product or a digital product, there's a lot of similarity between the two. And then at the bottom, we have more of the visual design aspects, developing a brand design language and color materials and finishes. So just making sure that the look and feel is really consistent with uh, the particular market demographic that's being targeted. And then on the engineering side, we have really all the bases covered on, on that side as well. We've got mechanical, we've got electronics, both from a hardware and firmware perspective, uh, software as well, and then prototyping to really kind of validate the design as it goes through the process. And then getting the product into production. So here's where we're working with the tool makers, contract manufacturers very closely. Um, and then we also assist on the, the V and V aspect and regulatory compliance. And then also managing the life cycle of the product as it goes through its various stages. Um, this is some of the team that helps uh, get it done. So we have 25 people under the roof at our office in Long Beach, and then we have about 15 more um, not under our roof who are very close in context of um, being part of the core team as well. So spread across user experience, industrial design, engineering, again, on the electronics, firmware, mechanical aspects as well. And now Stacy will talk about how we work with a medical device startup. All right, so I'm very excited to be here and hear what all of you bring to the table in terms of helping startups overcome challenges. And one of the themes that I've definitely heard and I expected is that funding is one of the big challenges. So I'm gonna focus in on one of the ways you can help get funding is through proof of concepts, right? And there's multiple ways we can do that. So I'm gonna give you some examples and tell some stories there. All right, so as you're going through the process of launching a startup, you're constantly trying to gain, um, gain the ear of investors and convince them that your product is going to be a success. So you're going to hopefully start out with a great idea to begin with, right? <laughs> and you're gonna do some research, put together your business plan. You guys know all of this. Put together a patent if there's nothing uh, infringing. And the step that a lot of people don't think about is that proof of concept and making sure you understand um, if your users need the product, if the technology can't even be successful, can it work? And then also, are people willing to buy? So if you skip this step, you're gonna have a much harder time gaining funding going into full product development. And when you get into full product development, there's a lot of cost there, as a lot of you know. So you're continuing to climb that mountain if you don't do proof of concept on something that is new, or even an iterative design that is going in a different direction and adding some new technology. So it's important to go into that space. Now, if you are able to prove that you're meeting your users' needs, does that necessarily mean that they're gonna buy the product? No. No, it's important to understand the product cost early on. So back when you were even putting together that business plan, you should be estimating that cost, but you also need to get into some level of development quickly to understand what that cost can really be. So at Nectar, we have a product development uh, methodology and process that we use for clients that come to us who already have their concept proven. So we go through these steps of discovery, so understanding what are the requirements, what are the risks, what is the business strategy of the product, and then we generate a lot of concepts and come down to one single concept that we're gonna take into design for manufacturability. From there we create a, what we call a pre-production prototype, so it's a pre-tooled prototype, and we can then test and refine that design, and then we go into verification and validation with tooled parts, um, manufacturing ready parts, and then we sustain as well 
um, when a client goes into full manufacturing, we continue and help them um, make sure the design is working and it's being produced well through the manufacturer. So this is great for when, a, again, a design is already proven, but when it's not, we really help clients understand how to quickly get answers and how to quickly prove their concept. So we take them through a fast feasibility cycle. And this can be done on a lot of different aspects of the product, which I'll give some examples of. So we quickly do a discovery and concepting and even sometimes design um, of your product. And we do it only on the most critical factors. You don't want to be off designing the look and feel if you don't even know that the electronics are going to work. Right? So this helps us explore key technical risks very quickly, increase confidence in your investors and yourself, hopefully, <laughs> reduce the financial risk and also manage costs. So making sure that you're putting the most dollars in the most critical aspects of your design before going forward. Now, some people look at this and say, no, I, I just want to go straight to product development. I want to go all the way through with everything all at once. I'm a risk taker. Um, they, they think that it's going to cost more to do the feasibility steps and take more time. And honestly, I'd say it definitely shouldn't cost more. Um, and the only way it's going to take more time is if you did have a proven product and you, you took the time to do this. So for example, think about if you're the owner of Fitbit and you want to add a feature to be able to project uh, project your results anywhere. So you can take your Fitbit and shoot your results out on a wall, anywhere you're at. And if you go into full product development on that right off the bat, you start designing, doing the industrial design, um, getting into mechanical engineering, doing all the user research up front, and in parallel you're doing the electronics engineering to try to figure out what it's, what it's even going to take to add this feature you could find out that you've wasted all your time on the industrial design and research and even engineering, mechanical engineering, just to find out that the electronics are going to be five inches wide by two inches wide in a T-shape, and all the work that you did to create this beautiful design is not even going to fit. Right? So in that case, you may have to redesign or reconsider that feature, and you've wasted time and money. Right? So it is very beneficial to go through some quick iterations of feasibility. So here's an example of feasibility that we've been working on. It is a, an inventory management device. So it's a small device. It's about the size of a credit card and the depth of about a half an inch. And you can put these devices all over your supply uh, cabinetry and it simply has a take and return button. So you can walk up, anybody can walk up to an inventory bucket, say you've got supplies like syringes. You can take five syringes, hit take five times, and then the system sends that number to the cloud software, and your inventory is updated. So this client came to us and they said, we really want to add some features. But they didn't know up front exactly what features the users were going to want. So we did some contextual research, research, as well as had a really fun uh, facilitated workshop with the client. We got their cross-functional team together and our cross-functional team and brought together all the knowledge that we had of the different markets and the different users. And we identified what we wanted to add. And unfortunately, I can't tell you the exact features. <laughs> In about a month or two, we're, we'll be launching into uh, manufacturing and commercialization so we can talk then. But uh, so we went through this step of understanding what the customers might need and want and also what the client wanted. They were very excited about some of the features. And uh, we weren't sure if we were going to be able to make, make, uh, meet their cost target because they already had an idea of what the price sensitivity was of these different users and customers. 
Um, but they wanted the, the most features they could get out of this. And they also wanted to maintain that same credit card size and depth of half an inch. And now that was a big challenge, because now we're adding, we're adding features, we're adding electronics. And um, so our next iteration in feasibility was to find out, is that even possible? Um, can we achieve that same size by adding all these features? So we went through that iteration and found out that we could meet that size, but we didn't know if we could hit the cost target. So we went back in again, and as, as we were doing these different iterations, we were keeping cost in mind the whole time. We're always keeping cost in mind for our clients. Um, but we did a, a final iteration to really focus in on cost and find out if we could meet their cost targets. And we ended up through <laughs> a lot of searching for one of the technologies that we needed. We were able to hit their cost mark and go into full product development. So it was really beneficial to take these steps because we did change course a little bit here and there as we went through these iterations. And if we had gone forward and made assumptions around what we could do and what we could achieve, we would have had to redo a lot of the, the work, especially the look and feel. Okay. So the next example I want to talk about, um, the CEO of this company, Somnology, actually wanted to be here with us, but he couldn't make it down from San Francisco. But they have an interesting story where they did try to go ahead all the way into product development before they knew if the, if the product even worked. So they have a product that is monitoring sleep to diagnose sleep apnea. And uh, it's something that people can take home and use in, in their home so they can actually do sleep studies over multiple days and even months and, and years if they want to versus the current technology is all in the sleep center. So part of um, the, the chief technology officer of this company is Melissa Lim. She is a nationally known sleep specialist and she has a sleep center where people come into her, her office basically of the hospital and they sleep overnight. Well, when you're sleeping overnight, you're not sleeping overnight somewhere where you are not comfortable, you're not going to sleep the same. So we're developing this product that can be used in the home. And when the first company went in to do product development, they came out with this really great design. It looked very nice. And it's, it's right there. Um, and then they tried to jump directly to a um, ready-to-be-manufactured PCB. And they hadn't done anything to show that the technologies coming together could even work together. So there's five different sensors on this device. And also, the key to it all is figuring out the algorithm that analyzes all the data coming from these five different sensors and is able to output um, a correlated result. So we've gone through a couple iterations so far. Um, first was being able to write the algorithm based on these new sensors uh, using previous data. So there's data from the sleep center that we were able to analyze and write an algorithm to diagnose. And we've gotten to a 94% correlation factor with Dr. Lim. And we also at the same time needed to find out, can this technology work together? So using development kits, because um, a lot of sensors that are medical grade actually have small PCBs and libraries of code that you can use to put multiple together and run them and, and do any kind of testing that you need. So we did that and found out a couple of things. Um, we were able to assess the power needed, so we knew the battery size and whether or not it could fit in the housing. Thankfully it does, <laughs> or we would have had to redesign the housing. Um, we were also able to now take this device home with the sensors inside of it and it's different than what you would take, uh, take home once this is a manufactured product because it has a black box off the side of it that houses those extra PCBs. So we're not able to make the whole device as small it is, but as it will be, 
but it does simulate the same device. You just have this extra box off to the side that sits on your nightstand when you take it home. So now, with that device, we can have people taking this home and gathering more data on the actual device with the actual sensors, with development PCBs. So the next phase then that we're in currently is making, uh, improving on the technology. So we had some, some problems with the clip and, and getting clean data. We were getting a lot of noise in one of the sensors. And now we're also going to be developing that algorithm with actual data right from the device. Right? So again, we haven't even gone to a manufacturable product yet, but we're able to prove whether or not this can work. And that algorithm was key. Here's another example, and this one is so secretive I can't, I can't tell you what the product is itself. But from a proof of concept standpoint, it's just another challenge that we've been up against where a client came to us, and this is a medical device, and they have a system that's like the one on the left, where you've got this giant box that's so big it has to be carted around on, on one of those little wheelie stands at the, at the hospital. And they wanted to come up with a breakthrough form factor and really change the industry for this device. And so we've gone through a lot of iterations on this because this is a big move of going something from something this big to something that's simple and wearable. So we started off with identifying a technology that was very small um, and able to achieve uh, similar outcomes as the current device but it's in a very different way. And so we went through and were able to mock up a breadboard of this system with a much smaller drive and lay it down on a board and, and test it and find out with this smaller drive system that's completely different, will this thing even work? And what are the things that are gonna go wrong? And we actually learned a lot from it. Um, we learned that some of the different outputs weren't going to be reliable. There was too much of a lag. But we got it working enough that we could at least have some kind of device to go back to users and get a little bit of input and have an idea of what that form factor would be. How close are we to that wrist, that small wearable size device? From there, we knew that the off-the-shelf technology we were working with was bigger than we wanted, so we made a custom drive and got it down closer to the size that we wanted to go with. And again, we're able to then take that asset and go out to customers and get feedback and see how they liked it. And then finally, we found a new technology altogether that was going to get us an even smaller form factor. We were able to mock that up, do the user testing again, and get the feedback that we needed. So it's really important, again, to be able to quickly iterate through and not, not worry about all the features of your product. Just quickly iterate through the most critical factors and have assets to bring, to get customer feedback and also to prove to your investors that this thing is gonna work. Right? So I'll just go through a couple of different ways that we can do advanced prototyping. Everybody's probably heard of 3D printing. That's, that's the obvious one. But even in industrial engineering, or industrial design, we use a lot of foam, right? You wanna understand what is the form factor of the device and how does a user interact with it? So when you quickly mock something up in foam, it takes a couple minutes and a couple dollars, and you're already able to touch and feel what this device may be like. From a user interface standpoint, there's uh, simple software packages where you can actually mock up an interface, hit buttons, and make them move to other screens without generating any code. From a mechanical engineering standpoint, we make a lot of breadboards. So this is a simple mechanism that's literally on a board. 
<laughs> and we're able to test the mechanism, refine it, and make it work before we even put anything into CAD. And then from the electronics side, similar to the Somnology, Somnology example, we can use a lot of different development kits. So Arduino boards and Raspberry Pis, like uh, Francis had mentioned. Among um, other things like the sensors having their own uh, boards and libraries of data. So we would love to talk more about how to help anybody out with getting through these quick iterations of feasibility or even all the way through product development. So feel free to take down our information. And uh, I'd love to hear if anybody has any questions and I'd invite Carrie back up if you'd like to answer. On the example you showed, um, you engage with that client. Can you maybe sh share how long it took you to get that particular client to agree to your process and then the cost and the time frame of what you described? Ballpark, if you can. Oh, sure. Um, for each one or a specific no, one? Just the one that you showed where you kept reducing it down. You showed the iteration. Of oh, okay. The yellow wrist thing. Yeah. So uh, they were very on board. This, this client is a medical device client and they understand the time it takes to go through making this level of a change. So convincing them to go through these small iterations, um, that was not a challenge at all. Whereas um, other clients, especially startups, have a harder time with that because they're so anxious they think you can just go into product development. Um, so the time it's been so far, and I've greatly minimize the amount of effort that's gone into this, but so far it's been about a two-year um, uh, relationship with them. Two-year, and so the time horizon for actually going into production on this latest iteration is projected to, you know, what's your timeline of? We're there. As far as I know, um, Carrie knows a little bit more about this one, but uh, I believe we're ready to uh, yeah, we're about a year away, really. It's another year into, to launch. yeah, to launch. To launch into production or to launch into? Uh, to production sales. that we can get some testing going. From the ballpark to your, your charging retainers, and obviously it's a monthly basis for all your skill sets you provide to them. Right. You know, in terms of costing? Yeah, so I'm just curious how you work with a new company and convince them, and obviously, they're trying to budget them doing it or you doing it. Right. I've got a client right now that is going through an iteration, and they are trying to reduce down their size. And the way they did it was more expensive in the time it took them, and they really need to do it again. Got it. And got now it. they've got a product out on the market, and the process they did was from here and working overseas mm -hmm. and allowing it to be directed more from the manufacturing as opposed to how you guys are operating in more of the strategy and right. testing and iteration and getting feedback instead of just creating and having a finished one and then you're out there. Yeah. Oh. So he's already getting the, you know, he's getting feedback of the pushback about ideas that he should have had. And so all of a sudden there's this bunch of new iteration already. And so I'm just yeah. curious how you uh, do that. Yeah, exactly. So that's, that's the quandary that a lot of medical device clients come to us with because there's going directly to the contract manufacturer versus working with more of a design and engineering group. So the contract manufacturer's goal is really to make it and then make money behind selling it. So, and then they design it around their processes and approaches from a manufacturing standpoint design and engineering firms typically can be more agnostic in terms of picking the best approach, not necessarily the best approach that we have under our roof that can f facilitate making it. So, I mean, obviously, you know, we're going to say it's better to go with the design and engineering firm <laughs> in that respect. Um, and then from a costing aspect, we really work with our client to define the scope of work and understand what phases we're going through, understanding the tasks that we're doing, and then budget those out so the client has full visibility in terms of overall costs. So, you know, from a monthly standpoint, and then if we're saying, well, you're out, this is approximately how much we think it's going to be. So they have a very good idea from an overall budget standpoint about how much it's going to be, not 
you know, we're, we're saying, well, it's 100,000, and it comes back, oh, well, and that's 500,000. We really try to be very realistic in the context of the overall time and budget because yep. there's nothing worse than, you know, telling a client that, oh, we'll have it done in two months, and then six months later, you know, it's still being developed, essentially. So we try to be very realistic in, in that regard from a budget and schedule standpoint. Have any companies and hired you to reposition their strategy by including you? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, so from a, a strategy standpoint, um, typically the earlier we can contribute, the, the more effect that we can have on the development process. And again, if the, you know, the company has gone down a certain path, but that path may or may not be the correct from either human factors, usability, or workflow standpoint, then having to circle back and redo it is much, always going to be much more expensive than kind of kind of doing the, the quick iteration approach that, that Stacy had walked through where we're kind of kind of looking at the feasibility from different aspects. Okay. And I wanna I wanna touch on your first question there a little bit too. Um, one of the things that this company did, because it is a very breakthrough change, um, they actually did launch a revision of the product. Um, I'd say about halfway through our our last two years where we were working on small aspects of the product <coughs> along the way while we were trying to go for the big change. And um, they were able to launch a second revision of the product with the new added feature so that they are staying fresh, not waiting, not waiting till the full change is made. All right. Uh, devices, or is your focus more on on the beginning steps? So we offer the same outputs, um, like engineering outputs and documentation that uh, ISO 1345 requires. Um, however, we don't uh, do the certification, and um, we usually just offer the correct documentation to our clients, and they're working with uh, the CM who's either, if they're working with a contract manufacturer, they make sure that that's uh, 13485 certified, or they themselves get that certification. And how, what percentage of your company is medical device? Um, as Carrie said, it's about 70% now. Okay. Mm -hmm. 